Uh, we're <laughs> in the middle of our series, uh, Living Your Best Life, which obviously that throw wasn't my best throw there, I hope. Or maybe it was, and that's really terrible. But we're talking about living your best life, and it kind of fits this time of year, right? Uh, we're all talking about how we can have a, a better 2020 than a, a 2019. We want to live our best life. And as much as we would try to do that, what, what we believe is that, that Jesus lays out some realities for us to live by in this section of Scripture, which is called the Beatitudes, which is at the beginning of his longest sermon, at least the longest sermon recorded, um, the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we're talking about these blessings that Jesus gives us as his disciples. And these blessings that he gives us as his disciples equip us, empower us by his Spirit to live our best life now. So we've been marching through these, and now we come up to the sixth one here. And uh, so I want to share with you um, from what Jesus says. I encourage you, you know, as you come to church on, on the weekends, uh, I encourage you to bring your own Bible. You see, I had my own Bible that I would bring that had a little note-taking section in it. It was great, except it was ESV, which is kind of a pain to read. The NIV is, is a much better one to read, and then because it had this little section on the side where I could take notes, the words were really, really small, and I don't need any more help tripping over the words as I'm trying to read the Bible to you in the morning. So don't bring that one, but I got this one here, and so I encourage you to bring your Bibles on, on Sunday morning so you can follow along with us. Uh, Jesus began teaching uh, in Matthew chapter 5. I'll pick up with verse 1, and then we'll, we'll get down to what we're talking about this morning. Now when Jesus saw the crowd... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach. Notice it's his disciples that come to him. And he said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And that second one, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, is, is what we're going to be talking about. Because last week uh, we dove into blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And we talked about those people as the ones who have experienced the mercy of Jesus and are therefore consequently have become merciful. The, the chief task then that we have to discern this morning is what does Jesus mean by the pure in heart? What is he talking about? And so I started thinking about what does it mean to be pure in heart. And I started, of course, I first thought about children, my children. I thought, oh yeah, children are innocent. You could have that next slide up. Um, I thought about that, and then I watched them yesterday morning while my wife went to write. My children are not pure in heart. Because I watched one of them who never takes naps, like gave them up like, four years ago, take a nap because she knew that it would annoy her sister. <laughs> Children, even from the very early age, are not pure of heart. They know the buttons to push on their siblings, and they push them just to get under their skin. That does not sound like pure in heart to me. So what does pure in heart mean? What is Jesus talking about? You look out at, at our culture, and, and maybe, maybe not here, but out in our culture, if you were asked someone what pure in heart means, you'd probably get as many different definitions of what it means to be pure in heart as the number of people you ask. Because there's this varied opinion about what is really right and true in our world. As I said, the chief task is to determine what Jesus meant. And as I was... Meditating on this phrase, uh, this scene from a movie popped into my mind. And, and basically the scene is someone was involved in some sort of tragic thing. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but ended up with blood all over their hands. And, and the scene was them scrubbing their hands over and over at the sink. And over, even though they got the blood off, they, they didn't feel like they could be clean. Reminded me of something I read in the Psalms. I used to joke about uh, how Lutherans are more likely to bring a hymnal to church than a Bible. Especially back in the Midwest. 
when I, the new hymnal came out, the, the maroon one that we now have, my mom, see, I didn't think I was one of those people, but I am. My mom got me a hymnal with my name on the front of it. I thought, this is silly. People should bring their Bibles, not a hymnal. But after I thought about this a little bit more, the Psalms were the hymnal of the Israelites. And the Psalms were the things that the people of Israel carried in their hearts wherever they went. There's even a section of the Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent that the people of Israel would sing on their way to Jerusalem. You know, your first, like, car music. And they'd sing these psalms as ways to remind them of who God is and what God does. And in Psalm 24, the psalmist David asked this question. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And there you get that idea. That idea that, that the hands are stained, that the heart is unclean, and none of the washing that we can do can make it clean. As I was trying to figure out what pure in heart meant, I, I did what I usually do, and I put it into Google. Just because I was curious. You know, you got to know what people in the world think about these words so you can understand it. I got all kinds of weird things, a, a box of water, pictures of the honest company and their, their products. And I stumbled on this quote by C.S. Lewis. And he said, it is only safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God. For only the pure in heart want to. So what is Jesus talking about when he says pure in heart? And if we want to know what Jesus is thinking about when he's talking about pure in heart, we need to go to his book, to the Bible. And there's this great story in Genesis chapter 20. You've got to read this story. See, Abraham married above, like most of us guys do. And he's going out into this foreign land, and he says, you know what's going to happen? These foreign leaders, they're godless pagan people, and so they're going to say, wow, that lady's hot. Let's get rid of this guy, and let's take her. And so he tells Sarah, I don't think he thought this out, his wife. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> say that you're my sister, and then they won't kill me. So they are going through the country, and they run into King Amblech, and King Amblech, uh, Am Am man, that's hard. i got to look at how I wrote it here so I know how to say it. King Ambledek. Am I still messed it up. I Abimelech, thank you. I knew I practiced that this morning. <laughs> Abimelech said, wow, Sarah's high. I'm going to take her for my wife. See, he didn't think this out at all. Like, how is this going to work out good for you, Abraham, if you go around telling people this? Like, either way, it ends up bad. Like, either you lose your wife or you end up dead. Like, there's no winning here. And so King Abimelech, I got it, takes Sarah for his wife, and all of a sudden God shows up in a dream to King Abimelech, I'm practicing now, and says, you have brought shame on your country and curses them, and so King Abimelech wakes up the next morning, calls in the advisor and says, what is going on? And he calls in Abraham and says, Abraham, what have you done to me? Why did you say this? And he says, well, I was sure that you'd kill me if you knew that she was my wife and take her for yourself anyways. And, and so the whole thing turns out it ends up okay. And so pure in heart here means with innocent intent. Not with evil intent, but innocently. And so King Abimelech took Sarah without knowing that she was Abraham's wife. So pure in, it, in ugh, pure heart, innocently, with no obvious ill intent. So that's kind of the first thing that, that guides our thinking there. But now let's go and look a little bit deeper. deeper. In, in Timothy, Paul also uses the phrase. And here in this text, he's, he's talking to Timothy, who he's sent to Ephesus. He says, as I urged you when you went to Macedonia, stay in Ephesus so that you may commend certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Or devote themselves to myths or endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience, and sincere faith. And so here, 
When Paul is talking out of a pure heart, he's talking about this command that he gave Timothy, and the command comes out of that pure heart is love for others. And so here, when Paul is talking to Timothy about pure heart, he's saying that a pure heart leads to love for others. And then in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul says, Flee the evil desires of your youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call the Lord out of a pure heart. Uh, Once again, Paul is dealing with Timothy and and talking with Timothy about dealing with false teaching. And here he's talking about the only source that that we as people of God can rely on in difficult times. And, And anybody that's been in a church in conflict knows that the only source for that is God. And so here he's telling Timothy, in the midst of of difficult situations, when people are disagreeing and people are fighting about what the word of God means, you need to, out of a pure heart, trust in God alone. So here, pure in heart means dependence on God, on the true God and what he can do for you. And then, of course, you can't think of pure in heart without thinking of the words of the psalm that were read a few moments ago. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In fact, these were the first words that that popped into my mind when I started thinking about the pure in heart. And, And so here, the pure in heart, the pure in heart are those who have been purified by God's forgiveness and love. And so if we we put this all together, the pure in heart, the pure in heart are are those who have an innocent motive, uh, those who have a good standing in front of God as a forgiven sinner. Or if we're to look at it in a more holistic way, it's those who have a, a good standing in God because of his forgiveness and out of that are engaged in love of God and others. So that's a pretty good definition of, of what pure in heart means. But I think we can go deeper. And I think that, that there's more that we can learn here as we try and understand what Jesus was talking about when he talked about the pure in heart. Because Psalm 24 is the only other scripture that talks and uses that exact phrase, the pure in heart. And as an argument goes for for why we should use that text for understanding what Jesus is talking about, is it's the only other place in Scripture where that exact phrase is used. Uh, Second, in both of the contexts, we have people going up onto mountains. And then third, as we, we talked about last week, in the context of both very near is the word mercy, and mercy from God being shown to people. And then finally, we have the evoking of this image of those who are pure in heart being able to see God. So if we go to Psalm 24, and I would argue that, that these psalms were things that, that just like the Israelite people before him, Jesus had tucked in his heart. If we go to that psalm, we read these words, that question that I asked earlier, who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place so what are we talking about when we dive into those words there because the next phrase says the one who has clean hands and a pure heart there's that pure in heart and it says who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god Uh, quite literally that first phrase says who does not lift up his soul to vanity And there's some idioms there that that get translated so we can understand it. But I think knowing that background helps us understand. Because there's things that we as people long for and look for in our lives. Because if I were to ask you if you have any idols, most of you go, no, I don't got any idols. I'm good. I don't have any little statues sitting around my house that I pray to or look to. And, And that's not a common thing in our lives. But we have idols all over. Famous theologian said the human heart is an idol factory. We're constantly trying to, to find things, to search for happiness in things other than the one place where true happiness and true life can be found, and that's in Jesus. 
and so an idol is anything that we, we long for or we lift our soul up to when we say, if I just had that this time of year, if I just had lost 10 pounds because I ran like I promised I was going to. And we see these things and we say, if we just had that, then things would be great in my life. It's an idol. A second phrase, who does not swear by a false god. And really what that's kind of talking about is kind of this uh, Jesus and attitude. Like I've got Jesus, but I also need this in order for everything to be right, for everything to be whole. I was an athlete at one point in time, maybe not anymore. But athletes have to be the most superstitious creatures on the face of the earth. Right? I can still tell you my exact routine when I ran. We had to win the bus race. And what that meant is we had to arrive at the course, at the track, before any of the other teams. And, and I just, I, like, I needed that. And then when I was racing, especially in cross country, I had this routine that I'd go through. We'd go and we'd walk the whole course, and then we'd run a mile, and then I'd stretch. And then I'd put on my spikes. I wouldn't tie them. And I'd run a couple of runouts to make sure everything was loose. And then I'd go put my feet up on a tree. And then I'd cinch down my spike so I was ready to go. And then I'd go run a couple more. And then, once I'd done all of those steps and done all those steps exactly right, then I felt ready to race. Sometimes in our lives it's the same way when it comes to the things of God. We want to say... I'm only right with God, or worship is only right, or things are only right in my life, if all the things are checked exactly as they're supposed to be checked, and they're done exactly right. Jesus and. Sometimes we get into the trouble of the Jesus and, and we say, if I'm right with Jesus, I have things going right with Jesus, but I also need this to be right in my life. Whether it's uh, my work or my relationship with family or uh, my relationship with the in-laws. All these things and, and then I'll be okay. And the message of this text is it's about Jesus. Not Jesus and something else. It's about Jesus and being made right with him first. And out of being made right with Jesus and his work in your heart and your life. Everything is already whole and complete because of what he has done. And out of that, out of being made whole and complete in Jesus, then you're able to bring his reign near to others as it has come near to you. Because the important thing about drawing near to Jesus is to get Jesus. All that other stuff is what we in the church would call adiaphora. Uh, things that aren't crucial for salvation. But sometimes we as people feel like it's Jesus and we've got to have all this stuff and then it's right. But the message of the psalm is it's got to be Jesus and Jesus alone. And don't get hung up on the other stuff because it's a trap. It's Jesus. So if we're to look at this psalm, psalm lays out some basic steps. Some basic steps about how we can have a, a, a clear and a clean and a pure heart. If we want to have a, a clean heart, we of course do what David did in Psalm 51 and we repent. Second thing we can learn from this psalm is, is that we as God's people need to know our idols so that we can then reject them. And then finally, seek God's face in his word and in prayer. As it says in verse 6, such is the generation of those who seek him who seek your face, O God of Jacob. But here's the problem. The psalm was written by David, who was the second monarch of the Israelite people. Did the Israelites ever get it right? If I remember rightly, it only got worse. 
it never really got better. And although those three things are good things for us to remember, good things for us to put into practice, um, repenting, uh, knowing our idols so that we can reject them, and seeking God's face and his word and his prayer, are those things going to get us to a pure heart? It didn't work for the Israelites. So how do we have a pure heart? Psalm envisions God dwelling with his people. In fact, the the rest of this psalm is is words that one of the famous hymns of the church is based upon, lift up your heads, you mighty gates. And the, the hymn talks about this psalm, talks about the king of glory drawing near, the Lord Almighty. That's what's happening here in this text. As Jesus comes and sits down with his disciples. The Lord Almighty is sitting down and speaking to them and blessing them with his presence. He is giving them the thing that this psalm so long ago promised that that God was going to draw near to his people. And more than that is Jesus comes to his disciples, even to you and me. He gives us pure hearts. Our God has come to us and given the very thing that is demanded of us so that we can see him face to face. Pure in heart. Pure in heart are those who believe that the God of Israel can be found in this Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus has called them and called us and in calling us makes known to us the realities and the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven the reign of God in Christ Jesus and he gives us pure hearts and that is something we earn that is a gift a a gift so that we can come into his presence And we can invite others into his presence. You see, the thing is, is that the last one we talked about, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. These two are connected. You and I, we have received mercy and have become merciful because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And we're that way because we've been given pure heart. Pure hearts to know the face of God in Christ Jesus. See, everything you need to know about God and his heart towards you is made known in Jesus and his love and his forgiveness for you and his death and in his resurrection. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you sat down, sat down among the disciples. And Lord, it's easy to think of you as someone other than apart from us, yet Lord, you draw close to us in your son Jesus. Help us to, to look to you and see the face of God in your words, in your deeds as you share who you are as you lay out your love for us in your scripture. Open our hearts. Make them clean, make them pure, even as we have just begun to believe and repent. Lord, help us to know that it's not about getting it right, but knowing who you are and your love for us in Jesus. Gracious Lord, we pray this, looking to you as Lord and Savior. In his name, amen.